please join me in prayer. Good and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable to you, God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus says these words as he is being criminalized, even though he has committed no crime. As he is being punished, given the ultimate penalty for something he did not do. As he is being brutalized, stripped naked, whipped and bleeding, hanging from a cross, sentenced there by leaders whom he spoke out against before crowds of people that he sought to set free. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Is this your king? Today is Christ the King Sunday, this church's namesake. We may wonder why this name was chosen to represent this congregation. Why is it important for Christ the King to be a part of this church's identity? When we hear the words, blank is king, we think of a number of images and identities. Kings are men, oftentimes white men, who are wealthy, who are in power, who rule over us. We listen to our kings. We follow our kings. If this church was called Wolfgang the King, then we'd follow Wolfgang. If it was Daniel the King, then we'd follow Daniel. If it were Nakia the King, well, that wouldn't happen because I'm a woman, nor could it be Athena the King. This church is not Wolfgang, Daniel, Athena, or Nakia the King. It is Christ the King. Therefore, this church follows the words, the example, the vision, the actions, and the will of Christ. That is this church's namesake. That is what we strive to live into. No matter who is pastor of this church, we, people, beloved people of Christ the King, follow Christ above all else. So what kind of king is Christ? What does it mean for us to declare that we are Christians, heirs of the kingdom of Christ? How do we act justly, walk humbly, and love mercy in the ways that Christ wants us to? How do we act differently from those who declare Christ as king and use this declaration as a means to inflict harm upon others, to declare themselves the winners and others losers? God could have come as anything at any time. God could have been born into any family, could have been born into any circumstance, any race, any age, any socioeconomic status. And yet, God was born of a woman, born of a poor woman, a refugee woman, on the run from a tyrannical king a king who sought to murder the son she would give birth to, to murder all sons of her ethnic group, the Jews, that they would give birth to. So that Herod, this king himself, could remain the ruler of the Jews. So that Herod himself could remain the person in power. So as Herod hunted down these children, Mary and her fiancé Joseph had to run in order to protect their baby boy, this impoverished, marginalized, innocent baby boy. This is who God was born into. This is who Jesus was born as. And yet this one, not Herod, is the one we call king today. It was all intentional. It was not accidental or coincidental. It was all purposeful. It's as if Jesus is saying, the last will be first and the first will be last. Oh, but he did say that, didn't he? Is this your king? This is our king. This is our Christ. In the Jeremiah passage that Pastor Cece read, the prophet writes, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. 
Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. This passage illustrates why we need a King Jesus. Those who have been put in power exploit the many and benefit the few. Today in the U.S., Christianity is represented as Christian nationalism, the twisting of politics in the name of Christ to, to keep specific people in power, to uphold systems of white supremacy and harm, to be the way of dominance, the way of seeking money, of seeking status. But this is not the way of Christ's kingdom. This picture does not represent Christ's actual kingdom. These are the broken kingdoms of the world, the kingdoms where some lord their power over others, the kingdoms where leaders pretend to be justice-seeking, but when faced with injustice, choose to turn away from it to protect their own comfort, their own jobs, their own benefits, their own six-figure sal salaries, or choose to perpetuate it by lashing out against those who point out the injustice. Woe to the shepherds who isolate those who speak truth to power. Woe to the shepherds who drive out those who speak up for the oppressed. Woe to the leaders who choose their comfort over the liberation of those who are victims of racism and racist societies, of classist societies and systems, of systems that drive out the many, keeping them in bondage, while the few are safe and benefit from their oppression. Woe to these leaders. Jeremiah goes on to say, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. This is our king. This is Christ's kingdom. This image is an image of a cast of a sculpture that was made in Toronto. This one is in front of a church in New York. And it's an image of homeless Jesus. This is Jesus. This is the place where justice and righteousness reign. The place where we find Jesus sleeping next to those who are unhoused walking alongside those who are impoverished, oppressed alongside those who too are oppressed. In the first Black Panther movie, I was hoping one of the kids would say T'Challa was the king, but in the first, in the first Black Panther movie, after beating T'Challa, Eric Killmonger turns to the crowd and asks, is this your king? In other words, asking, is this man who is brutally beaten by me, who has been taken down and presumably humiliated, the man you call king? The subtext here being that kings are supposed to be the most powerful, the fiercest fighters, the ones who can take control, the ones who are always triumphant and always on top. If we judge a king based on how they look to those who are also in power, by whether or not they are revered, we will never choose the one who chose meekness over might and humility over honor. The one who stood up to those who could have put him in a permanent, prominent position of power in order to stand up for those who were being oppressed. The one who chose forgiveness over persecution. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Theologian Deborah J. Mumford writes, the kingdom of God for Jesus was a world where those on the bottom of society in his day would find liberation from the systems and structures that bind them. Those who were captive, like the two criminals with whom he was crucified, would be released, end quote. This is the king we follow. Our king did not choose a comfortable life. He chose the life that he knew would put him in the most danger 
of being made an example of by the ruling class. Crucifixion was an act that was reserved only for those who were not Roman citizens. It was for the marginalized, those outside of the system of superiority. The cross was not a source of pride. It was the lowest form of torture for the people whom the Romans considered the lowest form of people. The cross was telling people, if you try to speak out against authorities, you will be here. If you stand up against injustice, you will be here. If you don't keep your head down and stay in your lane, you will be here. And Jesus, born into society at a time where this form of torture was very well known, he knew this and yet still did all of these things. This, beloved people, is our king. This is who we follow. Whenever we stand up for those being treated unfairly, we are following our king. Whenever we speak out against injustice, we are following our king. Whenever we choose discomfort by standing up to those who hold their power over others, against those who try to ostracize, scapegoat, or look over others, we are following our king. This is our king, Jesus, inviting us to follow him, to liberate, to empower, to seek justice for and fight for the voiceless and the oppressed alongside him. I leave you with a short video from a, a pastor named S.M. Lockridge, Dr. S.M. Lockridge. It's a pastor from Calvary Baptist Church in San Diego, California. I'm not sure when it was preached, but it's been made into a video. This particular one was made by people from my old church in Rockford, so that's kind of fun, but it's a beautiful, powerful video, and I leave you with that. The Bible says, my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the weak. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. 